2020. The sales clerk working in retail hell with piggy customers. And you won't believe what they leave behind. Um, dirty underwear, used band-aid, snotty tissues. Mark Cuban's Christmas toy inventor. We have a deal. Can his magic turn this bike into the next Cabbage Patch Kid? It made me think about my kids, and so it really hit home. The fake out artist peddling super fakes. 2020 goes undercover. All right, no hit, no hitting. The mall cop. Take a hike, Paul Blart. We caught one of them going too far with a taser. And the package people. Will they go postal on your Christmas present? A 2020 experiment. Shopping confidential. Here's David Muir. Tonight, the countdown to Christmas is on. How many of you will be at the mall this weekend checking off who's left on those lists? So this evening, a shopper's guide. The secrets revealed. Who knew you could go to the big name stores and bargain for a better price? The knockoffs. Could you spot a super fake? But first here tonight, the view of the mall you haven't seen from a one-time mall cop armed with tiny cameras. Matt Gutman tonight on The Case. It's Shopping Confidential. It is to buy your toys from us today. Shopping seems America's real full contact sport, where folks sharpen their elbows and leave all that holiday spirit in the parking lot the girl! before blitzing the mall. Like this crazed mob bursting through the doors of a California store. Yep, a shopping trip these days can be a downright hazardous activity. This Black Friday in Philadelphia, an all-out brawl erupts between two couples, with that woman zapping her opponent with a stun gun again and again. And also last month, surveillance video caught a more dangerous species of shopper, so-called flash robbers who swarm stores making off with racks full of loot. Another group of them even tramples an employee in their getaway. But what about those people hired to keep shoppers safe? You'd expect your trusty mall cop to crack down on any of those out of control shoppers like this crowd, right? Wrong. But it turns out most mall cops are specifically trained not to intervene. Most of the training that you'll find with the professional security officer will be to observe and report and wait for law enforcement or the proper uh, authorities to respond to the situation. And that brings us to the story of a lone mall cop who apparently didn't get that message. Darren Long became an internet sensation for what he did to keep the shoppers at his mall safe. Last year, Long landed a job as a guard here at the Metro Mall in downtown Atlanta, an area surrounded by government buildings. That means the mall should be packed with shoppers, but they've been driven away by the rampant crime in the neighborhood. Basically, the clientele of this mall were some of the toughest people in town. All kinds of stuff going on down there. So when I first got there, it was damn near open air drug market. That's how easy I could spot people doing things. Even though the job only paid 500 bucks a week, Long came in kitted out more like RoboCop than a mall cop. Walk me through the uh, inventory of, of what you have on you. Uh, Smith & Wesson 9mm. This is a 16-inch ass baton. Very good thing. This is the Taser X3. And a tactical vest. Yeah, with a GoPro on it, which is probably the most valuable tool in the arsenal, the GoPro camera. Long wore the camera to document his encounters in the mall. Much of his time was spent keeping the peace by breaking up fights. Break it up! Break it up! Or helping settle customer disputes. That's it. But when it came down to busting the illegal activity in the mall, Long preferred an iron rod to the golden mean. Hey, man, what do he give you? What's this? In this video, he catches a man selling drugs and boots him out of the mall. Hit the gate. You, you're gone. Both of you, out the door. Long's in-your-face approach clearly rubs people the wrong way. You gotta leave them all, dog. Put your hands, I bet I'll beat you. Although he's often surrounded by a hostile crowd, he never gives an inch. Hey, man, you can't come in. Hold up. Didn't I tell you you couldn't come in here? We got a problem. Even when he's menaced by this man holding a brick. Hey, hey, hey. These aren't just scuffles. This could be life or death. Somebody could get shot and killed. Yeah, I took it, you know, sometimes I just took it to that level. And this, this is a very aggressive uh, culture down there. You show any weakness, man, these people will walk all over. You better back it up. And the confrontations got even more intense. 
When Long tries to boot a man he says was banned from the premises, he finds himself outnumbered four to one. You better watch the bet, bro. Long may be alone, he's got a friend. He pulls out his trusty taser and bids good night to his top assailant. When that doesn't pacify the crowd, Long has to up the ante. I'm telling you right now, y'all better back up. All right, that's that's the real thing right there. That's no taser. That's a Smith and Wesson. When you watch it now, do you ever think was this excessive? Maybe I didn't have to tase them. Maybe I didn't have to pull out my weapon. Oh no, when they started to advance toward me, oh no, the firearm had to come out. So after the taser, there's nothing but bullets. That's not anything that I would allow our security officers or anyone to do. Direct confrontation is a big no-no for most mall cops, even in deadly cases like this fatal carjacking at a mall earlier this week. When this armed shooter entered a New Jersey mall last month and began firing, mall cops scrambled to get customers to safety instead of going Rambo like Darren Law. You better back up! There's no doubt in my mind that his heart is in the right place and that he's trying to do the right thing, but his tactics are 100% wrong. But Long's questionable tactics made him a hero to residents and business owners who'd long been frustrated by the city's neglect of the area. He brought to the world what we have been talking about for years to everybody. Somebody was taking uh, ownership, responsibility, and trying to do something about the area. You have to have courageous people like him, you know, to step out and do these things. But it was this confrontation that carried Long's reputation far beyond downtown Atlanta. Here, two women turn on him after he tells their kids to quiet down. Don't play with me. Long calmly retreats back inside the mall, but the woman wearing the red skirt follows him in and starts swinging at his face. Long has had enough, comes out taser blasting, and the woman goes down like a load of bricks. She goes down. Was there perhaps a better, more diplomatic way to deal with this? Well, after she hit me, no. But after I took so much abuse, okay, I'm tired of it. I'm not trying to hear this no more. That mother tasing clip eventually landed on YouTube and it went viral. Long became an internet sensation. People have never seen a mall cop act like this before. And one site dubbed him the kick-ass mall cop. You gotta like the name just a little bit. I know part of you likes it. Yeah, but I'm not kick-ass. It wasn't about being the biggest badass on the block. I'm the softest guy there. I'm the weakest guy there. I'm just the guy with the most freaking commitment. That's true, but it would cost him. That video was the beginning of the end of the kick-ass mall cop. This March, the Metro Mall gave the shopping center Flatfoot his walking papers, blaming a slowdown in business. Then, later that week, as he was finishing out his stint at the mall, Long tried to tackle a man he says he'd ordered off the premises earlier. This time, police took Long away in cuffs and charged him with battery. His career as a mall cop had come to an inglorious end. The thing that he's being prosecuted for is the kind of activity that goes on here all the time is just look the other way. And he is doing this on the property that he was hired to protect. Does it make you feel angry, though, that you were fired, that you got booted from the job in such a way? You know, not at all. You need to go on out the door, dog. It was just a job. It was just a job. I won while I was standing here, but I did not succeed. With Long gone, drug dealers and loiterers are now back inside the mall. Christmas, around the corner, Long himself has hit some hard times. With the pending charge, he can't get work as a security guard. Still, he has no regrets about his stint as the kick-ass mall cop. Good to see you, man. Darren, did you ever think, this is just a tiny little podunk mall. Is this worth dying for? It's the job, and I'm going to do the job. I mean, I tried to do what was right. I just tried to help some people. Coming up. Think it's hard shopping? Try being on the other side of the counter, selling. I feel like I need a bodyguard, right. you know. Confessions from the clerks. Plus, don't spend another penny until you see this. I want access to the secret sale. Next on Shopping Confidential. Twenty twenty Shopping Confidential continues with Juju Chang.
Ah, shopping. It should be a thrill, but for some, it's pure stress. It can even drive them crazy. So you might as well, not, you might as well stop talking. What's that like for the person behind the counter? Just ask Freeman Hall. You describe working in retail like it's hand-to-hand -hand combat. It can be a war zone. He should know. Hall spent nearly 20 years on the floor of big department stores, selling clothes and handbags. I've been called every name in the book. I have had somebody spit in my face. I've had people throw handbags at me. That's you know, like hardship duty. It is. But Hall got the last laugh. He started a blog, RetailHellUnderground.com, spilling the secrets of scorn salespeople. I wanted to create a community where people in the service industry could go and support each other, tell their stories, laugh, rant. Dish. Uh, dish, exactly. The customer is always right. Well, not on this site, where salespeople swap horror stories about their customers, or custies. Hall has even created custy categories. Category A, the cranky custy. They're dubbed crusties. And you're a crusty, you know, is like just... I don't want to deal with you. I'm going to run away and hide in the stock room, you know? <laughs> Category B is downright ghoulish. There's the blood sucker who will not buy anything and ask you a million questions and want to start talking about their bowel movements and their, their love affairs. Category C is meticulous to a fault. There's the picky bitches. The ones that are uh, taking out their magnifying glasses and, and analyzing everything and analyzing everything you do. Category D are the customers Hall says are downright pigs. The piggy shoppers, they're, they're horrible. In fact, you know, they go into a store and just ravage it. Hall posted this video of a discount store he toured pre-Christmas. <laughs> it's missing a wheel. <laughs> Dirty underwear. Disgusting. Describe the scene for me. And it was under siege by people who just didn't care. They were throwing things left and right, stuff on the floor, piles of things everywhere. How long will it take you to straighten this mess? Four hours. Spilling their drinks, throwing things everywhere, kids screaming. <laughs> Have you ever told a piggy shopper to stop making a mess? No, but I want to. Paul says it's the piggies who try to return so-called unused bags, despite the crazy clutter left inside. A, a hair-covered cough drop and paper clips and condoms and wedding rings and money and pictures and a, a boarding pass to the Philippines. Paul says shoppers beware. There are ways for salespeople to exact their revenge. A lot of times, if I didn't want to help somebody, I'd send them the customer service. If they're calling on the phone, you hang up on them, you know, giving false information. Like, we sold out of it. But the store at the very end of the mall, they have them. <laughs> so go check them out. Another sales side secret? Hall says be cautious of overly solicitous sellers. Chances are they're on commission. I find that when I go to some of the fancy stores, people are very eager to help me. They're under a huge amount of pressure. And whoever doesn't sell enough gets fired. They don't necessarily have your best interests in mind. No. And Hall confesses the power of persuasion for some salespeople involves truth twisting and name dropping. Well, you know, um, Jennifer Aniston was wearing that bag on TMZ. <laughs> Sorry, Jen. And then there's all the little lies about, oh, it's our last one, and there's 10 in the stock room. They've sold out everywhere. It's the it bag of the season. This is an investment piece. She'll have it forever, you know. Um, I had one lady, she just looked at me and she goes, you can stop talking now, I'll buy the bag. <laughs> So what do you do if you're in the mood for retail therapy, but don't want to end up in therapy? Hall suggests a truce. Ditch the price adjustment and go for the attitude adjustment. When you go to the store and the person behind the counter, if something doesn't go right, take a deep breath and just realize that that's a person and you're a person and yelling at them is not going to help. Now that is in the holiday spirit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Now I'm going to show you how being nasty to your sales clerk can actually cost you money. With T-minus four days and counting until Christmas, there are still extra savings to be had. It just takes a little extra effort to find them.
Enter Mark Elwood. He's a swashbuckling savings guru, author of Bargain Fever. He's ready to show me exactly where to start digging. You have to think of them all as a treasure island uh -huh. where there are buried chests everywhere. Right. And all you need are keys to unlock them. Okay. You ready to learn them? I guess so. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Big chain stores are now training their staff to strike a bargain. So it doesn't help to be naughty. Be nice to your salespeople. Call it the charm discount. That's the crucial thing to remember. A smile goes a long way. If you walk up to a sales assistant and you smile and say, good morning, how's your day? You're instantly making a connection. We wanted to put Mark's keys to the test. So we strapped on hidden cameras to uncover hidden gems. Remember, retailers don't advertise these discounts. Here's a mic, here's a mic, here's a mic, here's a mic. Hit your cameras at this button right here, right. this button right here. Okay, this three goes a pretty cool setup. So we set out to a mall to test a few random big chain stores. We'll buy the same items from the same sales associate and see if Mark can get a better bargain than me. The first key, good old fashioned haggling. So if I just get two, it would be 70. My first purchase, two sets of mixing bowls. I barely say a word and end up paying full price. 74 bucks. Thank you. Now it's Mark's turn. Sweet talking the clerk all the way. Quick question. These are these are lovely, but they're a little bit more than I want to pay. He knows to ask for coupons. Do you guys sometimes have coupons behind the counter? I don't have one in the store. But Mark doesn't take no for an answer. He cozies up to another sales clerk. A little aggressive charm can go a long way. Oh, but you do have one in the drawer. Oh, awesome. <laughs> After a few minutes of buttering up the salespeople, she offers him a coupon. If I smile a bit more, do you take 5% more off? Or? Okay, honey, the smile is cheap. You can accomplish so much with a smile. Exactly. His price? $64. That's $10 less than I paid on the exact same set of bowls. And his new BFFs invited him back in 48 hours for an even bigger discount. See Monday? Yeah. When you're going to the mall Monday, it's 25% off. So come over here in this mall, we like you. I know, I'll come back. 25% off. Oh, I'm not kidding. Barry Treasure, all for a smile. Mark's second key to unlocking a treasure trove of savings? Buying in bulk. As long as you spend $100, we'll take off 25. But it doesn't say that anywhere. So I had to know about it. Very much. Turns out, the more you spend, the more you save. Mark pays $15 for the same pair of jeans that I, the Wallflower, paid 25 bucks for. Thank you. His third key to tapping into a pipeline of savings? Use a smartphone app. It's telling me there are 165 coupons in this mall. Mark's app is called Retail Me Not. What makes this one different? What I love about Retail Me Not is it's geofence. And that's a smart word for saying it knows where you are. <laughs> so when it books out coupons, those are coupons for the mall that you are standing in. So the body butter is 20 bucks. Come on. So that's half price if you buy that. <gasps> I do. For half price, it's I half do? Half price, yeah. But in order to use the app or an online coupon, you still need to work magic on your friendly sales rep. His fourth key to opening up a hidden bounty? Loyalty, what retailers call clienteling. This works a lot more in some of the higher end stores. You find a sales assistant, you say, hi, I'm Mark. I'd love to shop here a lot. Could I make you my sales assistant? For this, Mark executes his signature move. I'm Mark, hello. Hi. He introduces himself to the salesperson because preferred customers get advance notice for sales and get clued into certain unadvertised sales. I want access to the secret sale before the price, you know, the pre-sale. Right. Can you give me access to that if I work just with you? Of course. Perhaps Mark just exudes charm. He certainly outshot me with technology and a little chutzpah. Again. So 25% off. That's very nice. Thank you. And again. So you get 20% off. So it's 40% off plus 25%. Right. I learned dutifully the secret keys to discount Nirvana. And now it's up to me to follow Mark's lead and turn up the charisma. A friend of mine said that I could get a discount if I asked for one. There is a 20% code out there. For yes, exactly. This is the code number. Does this work? That code will probably work. Really? And this time, the protege out schmoozes the master. I think I bested you. Really? I not only got the 20% off, I got an additional 15% off. I knew I could be charming too. Our thanks to Juju tonight. So what's the best deal you found this shopping season and how'd you get it? Tweet me, use the hashtag ABC2020, and we'll get the word out so everyone can save some cash.
Coming up, fakes so good, they almost fool the experts. Super fakes. How have they gotten so good? Yeah, Chanel. Yeah, yeah. We're taking it to the streets. Can we give you 200? Two hundred for the Chanel. Okay, okay, five, five hundred. That's it. The secrets they don't want you to know. All right, don't hit, no hitting. And still to come, Christmas magic from Mark Cuban. Next on Shopping Confidential. Once again, David Muir and 2020. We've reported on those fakes here before, fake purses, fake watches, knockoff shoes. But have you heard of a super fake? They're super costly and super close to the real thing. Turns out they're fooling even the experts and our own Biana Goladriga, too. Hidden cameras. Pushy salespeople. Really pushy. Knockoff designer handbags for sale on the asphalt aisles of Canal Street. New York's semi-secret world of counterfeits. Which one? This one, the 37? Where fake never goes out of fashion. But Grinchy grifters are everywhere this holiday season. In Georgia, just this week, police shutting down bad Santa retailers, saying, fo, fo, fo. Fake pocketbooks in hidden showrooms worth $20 million, if only they were real. On New York's fashionable Fifth Avenue, the inspiration for all that copycat couture. Genuine Dior, Chanel, Coach, like a mantra for people with too much money. Gucci, Prada, Vuitton. The names make you say, oh. The prices make you say, no. We all want bargains. We want cheaper things. So we turn around and say, fine, I'll take a fake. But not just any old fake. Our bargain buddy Mark Elwood is back. This time spotting something new. The next generation counterfeit handbag. It's called a super fake. A super fake comes from a factory, either at midnight where it vanishes when no one's looking, or maybe it was wastage. It was supposed to be damaged and someone can slip it in their bag and take it home. The super fake is better made, more expensive, harder to find. The term super fake was invented because essentially this fake is better than you could believe. Hand a fake handbag to an expert in bags and say, is this real or not? They might not be able to tell. In rare cases, experts say some are made with handcrafted leather, genuine handles and hardware. Some may even be produced in the same factories by moonlighting workers. A super fit bag is simply a great looking bag that most people would consider to be real. Counterfeiting expert Valerie Salembier gave me a pop quiz with a $900 Louis Vuitton handbag and its super fake illegitimate twin. Which is the real and which is the fake? I look into the bags, try to sniff out the imposter, and take a guess. This is the real? <laughs> fake, wow. Here's how you tell. Feet, oh, okay. a speedy never has feet, right. and then never this. has seams. Uh -huh. Of course, you can't see the seams if you buy online, where many super fakes are sold on fly-by-night websites. Louis Vuitton outlet on clearance. There's no way a Vuitton bag would ever be sold on clearance. They don't ever reduce the price if they're real. And so a super fake would cost you what? Anywhere from $350 to $1,200. And what consumers think is, gee, it's expensive, so it must be real. OK, time to go shopping. Fashion law professor Susan Scafidi takes us on a quest to score a super fake in Manhattan's Chinatown. And so Grand and Canal, the, the epicenter of, of the fakes trade on the street in New York, is where we're headed. We had a tip this park was a hotbed of super fake vendors. On this day, though, nothing more exciting than a game of cards. Then, a few blocks away, it begins. Sketchy salespeople whispering their pitch. Purses? Yeah. Yeah. What time? We literally were walking down the street. Somebody asked us. I, I, I got a bit of a rush, and, and I was kind of scared at the same time. <laughs> it was just a little frightening. Because you don't know where you're going. And, and what shocked me was we didn't have to go looking for them. They found us. Like this man who carries a showroom on his smartphone. The, uh, this is the, the Speedy is good. We order a classic Louis Vuitton Speedy bag, like the super fake we saw earlier. 
he asks us to wait. Just right here, you don't want us to come with you? Look, how, there's no stores. Everything is in the back. It's hidden. It's legal to sell it. For okay, me, so we can stay here? Stay right, I'll bring it to you. But then he spots our camera, and he isn't happy. Okay, all right, no, hit, no hitting, no hitting. In fairness, we didn't get a much warmer reception when we were shooting outside the Dolce & Gabbana store on 5th Avenue. And they're not doing anything wrong. What are you doing? I'm with ABC News 2020. I know, but Is there some problem? No, just... It's please. a public street. Where... Right, but you have to have a permit to be doing it. No, no, I don't. Yes, you do. We return to Chinatown the next weekend, this time with hidden cameras. In five minutes, we were offered designer handbags. Yeah, Chanel, yeah, yeah. Chanel? Sure. Yeah. Okay. We choose from a menu with pictures of designer purses. Should we ask to look at a couple? What, what did you see the most? Do you, want, do you want to look at Chanel? Let's see. We reject several garden variety fakes. It doesn't even smell like leather. It smells like a tire. And as you had warned us, they offer the cheaper stuff first, and you have to really ask for higher quality. At every turn, we're approached by sellers hawking other dodgy designer goods. Watch us. Thank you. But we stay focused on finding a super fake. Finally, we're offered something special, a Chanel bag. That's beautiful. That's nice. The real thing goes for nearly $5,000. A run-of-the-mill fake might cost 30 or 40 bucks. But this one wasn't nearly so cheap. How much is this one? $600. 600 is the highest price I've ever heard quoted on the street. Can we give you 200 We talk. 200 for the Chanel. No, so too Chanel. But it's got the, it's okay. got enough. Okay, nothing, nothing. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Five, 500 that's it. We haggled and got the price down to $430. All right, we'll do it. They even agree to take a credit card if we throw in a 10% tip of $43. A souvenir shop in the neighborhood runs the charge. We are now the somewhat ashamed owners of a super fake handbag. It has surprisingly authentic details, down to the card with the serial number, which further checking showed was also fake. Well, we did it. Congratulations. Congratulations. Super, fake. super fakes thrive because no one has any sympathy for a big handbag brand. No one thinks, oh, that poor company, it makes so many millions. I wish they could make a few more million. So I don't think there's very much guilt associated with buying something that is totally illegal. But a little guilt might be a good thing for shoppers. Even if you don't mind the moral equivalent of shoplifting from designers, you may care how much misery counterfeiters are spreading with your money. Certainly, we have evidence that it's gone to fund organized crime, that it's gone to fund terrorism. Uh, if you put your name on the label, you're going to be more concerned about your factory standards than if you're putting somebody else's name on the label and faking it. Uh, and that does lead to all kinds of labor abuses, including child labor. That's a lot of bad karma to carry around with your brand new fake handbag. And besides, it doesn't even go with your shoes. Coming up, when it comes to delivering presents on time, who's being naughty and who's being nice? It won't get broken along the way. A 2020 experiment to get this Santa statue cross-country in one piece. Can FedEx do it? Next on Shopping Confidential. Twenty Twenty returns with Nick Watt. One p.m. Third Street, Santa Monica, California, and like millions of you, I'm holiday shopping and fretting how my chosen gifts will make it cross country in one piece. Because, well, there are some horror movies of the hell our packages might go through en route from A to B. This is how you unload a FedEx truck. These are the gory exceptions, and after all these incidents, the companies took action to rectify the situation. I'm buying a gift for David Muir and testing the system. Thanks very much. All right, mission accomplished. Some kind of weird Santa thing that looks very, very breakable. Can you really send a plaster Santa from L.A. to New York City without it getting broken and smashed? along the way. 
1.30 p.m. FedEx, Maxella Avenue, Marina Del Rey. And we're met by Dana Hi. Alcala. Hi, I'm Nick. I'm Dana, nice to meet you. In the parcel packing game, this guy is Jordan, Elway, and Ripken, all rolled into one. Whenever a customer asks me, oh yeah, what happens when we file a claim? You know, it's kind of hard for me to answer that question because I've never experienced that. Career breakages, zero. Parcels packed daily, 30. Confidence, 100%. I am confident that I can package anything and it won't get broken along the way. What about Santa? Oh wow, this looks pretty fragile. Dana gets to work sharing secrets along the way. Kind of just almost massaging the bubble wrap just to see if I can feel the item. And if you can feel the item, it needs more, more bubble wrap. More bubble wrap. Put the filler right over here. A add some filler so it's not moving around. But then double box it too. And when we tape up our box, we always H tape it. We want to make sure to seal the seams on both sides. He's confident. Really? Really. Nice and safe. I did all I could to break it before it even left the office. And I'm just going to need that measuring tape again. Dana says his packages can survive being dropped four stories. UPS, by the way, has a testing lab in Illinois where they simulate truck jiggle, extreme temperatures, and just plain being dropped from a bit of a height. Anyway, back to David Santa. 5 p.m., he's on the move. 5.05, arrival at the sorting office, Delray Avenue. 7.15, Santa arrives at LAX, and a half hour later, he's on the tarmac, bound for Memphis. Here on the board, we see flight 1204, which is uh, departing LA in a few minutes. 1.09 a.m. and Santa arrives at the FedEx Global Hub in Memphis. 42 miles of conveyor belts. They're sorting half a million parcels an hour. Just go faster, a lot faster, and make sure we get the boxes out on time. Santa is scanned 10 times before finding his way onto an airplane heading east. There's a lot of pressure, over 20 million packages moving through the system tonight. These are massive organizations, and within them, there's bound to be the odd bad apple. I mean, UPS will deliver 130 million packages just in the week before Christmas. FedEx has 630 airplanes, 90,000 trucks, and 300,000 employees worldwide. And here's one of the very rare bad apples. It's just days before Christmas 2011 in Southern California. That's a computer monitor unwrapped, so the driver totally knows what it is. Whammy. I need to see that again. Nine million people saw this on YouTube, and that's just bad PR. FedEx posted an apology. I am upset and embarrassed. FedEx used this video as a training tool. And the driver? I can assure you we are working within our disciplinary policy an employee is not working with customers. And how about a UPS bad apple? How's she gonna get an 88 pound marble top table to Christina Tripp's front door in Colorado? Oh, she's gonna do it like that, roly poly. Unsurprisingly, the marble shattered into five pieces. And UPS paid up. 6.05 a.m. Santa has landed in Jersey, Newark Airport. 40 minutes later, he wheels up for the Big Apple. 0915 Manhattan, Santa's final sorting office. It was offloaded, put on the conveyor belt system, came up and went to the designated route that's going to go out and deliver it for you. David, I imagine, is getting rather excited about his delivery. 10 a.m., ABC News World Headquarters, New York City. The POD, proof of delivery. And Santa's final destination, 17 hours, 30 minutes since he left Marina Del Rey, California. Will he be broken? Will I get to file a complaint? All right, here we come. The moment of truth. 10.34 a.m., David Muir's office. Intact, tasteful, heartfelt. This is a powerful moment between Nick Wilde and me. The moral of our holiday story, remember Dana's packaging tips you always want to overpack. And you too can send a fragile Santa clean across the country, safe and sound, in time for Christmas. Nick, I didn't know you cared.
when we return. Mark Cuban's Christmas gift to a toy inventor. We have a deal? We have a deal. Amen. All right. Could this be the next big idea for under your Christmas tree? It's crazy good. Next on Shopping Confidential. Twenty twenty Shopping Confidential returns. Here's Deborah Roberts. Come in! When it's the season for buying, it's the shopper who decides what's hot. Oh my God! Oh my God! Thank you. And what's not. What is this? Well, what what'd you get? Pickle. And behind all that frenzy, some entrepreneur is desperately hoping to win a spot under your Christmas tree with the latest big idea. Mary Beth Lugo Look is one of them. Um, and if you could check out what colors we're low on. In three tough years, she's managed to roll her kitty bike into small toy stores. But Mary Beth now Did wants to yes? hit the big oh, time. I've that. been working really hard towards this. This is my one shot. A shot she's hoping to find on Shark Tank where dreamers compete for cash to bring their ideas to life. Just getting on the show's a long shot, yet just four hours after emailing her pitch, the phone rings. I was like, oh my gosh, that's Shark Tank calling. Before she could get over the shock, Mary Beth is in the tank, talking up her Kazam bike. Kazam is a balance bike that is revolutionizing the way kids learn how to ride. A cool two-wheeler with no pedals. Kids learn the balance of bike riding, no training wheels. With the help of Kazam, kids are having fun. Though she'd practiced back home with friends and neighbors, Mary Beth is feeling like bait in front of sharks like Mark Cuban. We just hit a pepper them with questions and questions. There's a lot of pressure when, when you walk in the door. I think once you get over the initial nervousness of, of, and then you're just in the moment, you just talk about, no? That didn't happen for me. No. <laughs> Soon? There's blood in the water. I don't feel that fire coming out. I'm out. But Mark isn't going in for the kill. What was it about her product and her presentation that grabbed you? What was cool about it, it made me think about my kids. And I remembered, you know, going through the whole process of teaching them how to ride a bike. And so it really hit home. And I'm going to give you 24 seconds to convince Barbara. So you're going to have to come high and come hard. This has become my life. And I am not willing to walk away from it until we become the top leader. I wanted to see how well she could deal with pressure. Sometimes you got to put them to the test. Do we have a deal? We have a deal. Amen. All right. Nice. I'm proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> Once you left, what happened? Uh -huh. Walked out, saw my husband, and cried for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lesson for entrepreneurs that sometimes entrepreneurs feel like getting an investment is the win. Oh, I got an investment. That's just the start. Because now that investor wants to make money. But that's tough in a business that's not all fun and games. Unless, of course, you stumble upon that out of the blue crazy idea, like the rainbow loom. Who'd have thought rubber band bracelets would lead to a frenzy and a pot of money? Suburban dad Chun Ying sure did when created.